we've labeled the final section in the book of Joshua, retention of the land. And that's because the threat of losing what Israel fought for hangs over each of these final three chapters. Now you can sense the tension right here at the beginning of the narrative in chapter 22. At this point, so far as the book of Joshua is concerned, the conquest is over. And Moses, just kidding, Joshua gathers all the Transjordan tribes to himself, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, and he says to them, you guys have kept the law of Moses. Great job. You helped your brothers um, win the land here west of the Jordan, and you guys can go home. See the land over there across the river? Right over there? Uh, that land is yours. Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben, go return there. Now, we don't know if uh, Joshua summoned these tribes to uh, Shechem um, or perhaps to Gilgal or maybe with Shiloh, but regardless, he says, you guys can go home. Only, he says, be sure here in chapter 22, be very careful to observe the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of Yahweh, commanded you. Uh, keep his commandments. Do you see how it's emphasized so strongly here in purple at the beginning um, of chapter 22, the final section of the book, keeping the law of Moses? Well, at this point, the drama is set. The Transjordan tribes kept the law of Moses inside the land. Will they keep it outside of the land? And what would it mean for them to break the law? I mean, what's greater? Uh, what is a greater violation of the law than to worship other gods? And how do you worship other gods? Well, you offer sacrifices to them on an altar. Well, that's no problem because the Transjordan tribes don't have an altar. That is until chapter 22, verse 10. Oh no! What happens at 22, verse 10? <gasps> the people of Reuben and of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an altar, an altar of opposing size. Dun, dun, dun. What is going on? Oh no. Well, um, the Cisjordan tribes, the, the tribes west of the Jordan, it appears as if they have a shoot first, ask questions later approach. Look at uh, verse 12. When the people of Israel heard of it, the building of the altar, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. Oh no, this is not a good thing. It's kind of a drastic uh, response, isn't it? But is that response appropriate? Well, I kind of think so. And let me show you why. It has to do with that chart we've been working our way through, um, obedience to the Torah of Yahweh, the word of Yahweh spoken through Moses here in the left column, and the obedience of Joshua and the people of Israel here on the right column. Um, so look at verse 16. The whole congregation of the Lord uh, says to the Transjordan tribes, what is this breach of faith that you've committed against the God of Israel in turning away this day from the Lord by building yourselves an altar in rebellion against the Lord. Now, why? Why is building an altar rebellion against Yahweh? Well, um, the tribes of Israel know it's rebellion because they know their Bible. They know Deuteronomy chapter 12, where it says that when you go over into the Jordan and you live in the land that God will give you to possess, and he gives you rest from all your enemies, then to the place that the Lord your God will choose, one place and one place only, to make his name dwell there. His, his presence will be located there above um, the Ark of the Covenant, within the tabernacle. It is to that one place that you will bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, to the altar in the place that Yahweh will choose, not to some random altar built by the Transjordan tribes. I don't care if it's of, of an opposing, imposing size. Um, so I think that in a sense, uh, this threat of imminent civil war here at the end of a relatively positive book is actually a good thing. Um, it is, this is the, the zeal of Phineas. Remember in Numbers 25, um, uh, which Yahweh certainly appreciates. However, this story does not end in war, thank goodness, um, as the following chiasm of uh, Joshua 22 demonstrates. Take a look at this. We're learning a lot about chiasms, aren't we? So here's a chiasm, um, which was presented by D. Uh, Jobling uh, of Joshua 22, um, where we learned that after 
uh, the Sister Jordan tribes send an embassy led by Phineas to the Transjordan tribes, and that embassy accuses them of breaking faith against Yahweh. We have these two um, oaths from the Transjordan tribes where they swear their innocence. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord. And then here in the center, they explain the purpose of this uh, altar. And, and look what they say. Um, Therefore, they said, uh, this altar that we built, is it's not for burnt offering or sacrifices. We're not um, attempting to worship any God at this altar. No, rather the altar is to be a witness between us and you that we worship the same God as you do. So, whew, um, possible devastation is nearly avoided here at the end. It's narrowly avoided here at the end of the book of Joshua. However, I do think that this narrative is meant to, li- to leave this ominous, foreboding taste in our mouths. I mean, right now, I suppose here at the end of Joshua, the, the political and religious unity of the tribes is maintained um, east of the Jordan and west of the Jordan. However, if we know our history, we know that this unity was fractured in Israel, um, not on east-west lines, but on north-south lines, the northern tribes and the southern tribe. And uh, it, after the fracture, there was not one rival altar, there was two, one in Dan and one in Bethel. So it seems as if this event anticipates that future fracture in Israel. Now, curiously, our buddy Joshua, Yehoshua, he's entirely absent from this chapter. He's not mentioned in chapter 22 at all. That's kind of weird. Now, it could be because when he does reappear in uh, chapter 23, verse 1, we are told again that Joshua was old and well advanced in years. Now, if Joshua was old way back in chapter 13, he must be ancient now. And this expression here in the beginning of 13 and the beginning of 23, it's nearly identical in the Hebrew. And it kind of forms a bit of a chiasm between the end of. Uh, the beginning and end of this latter half of the book of Joshua. And that has led, of course, um, let's see, where should we? Um, That, of course, has led uh, David Dorsey to see a chiasm there. Let's let's look at Dorsey's um, structure of the whole of chapters 13 all the way down to 24, where he sees the beginning um, as announcing Joshua's old age, and it's it's repeated twice. Uh, Joshua's old and advanced in years. So Yahweh says to him, you are old and advanced in years. Down to chapter 23, Joshua was old and well advanced in years. And he said to them, I am now old and well advanced in years. And if this chiasm is accurate, it does help to explain why um, just before, immediately before this statement of Uh, Joshua's age, we have a focus on the Transjordan tribes, just like immediately after a focus on Joshua's age, we have an earlier focus on the Transjordan tribes. Pretty interesting. Well, Joshua's old. Um, He is nearly on his deathbed, and therefore, uh, the final two chapters of this book will be his final address to the people of Israel. Just like Moses gives a final address before he dies in the book of Deuteronomy. Specifically, chapters 29 and 30 are going to resemble these two chapters very closely. And so Joshua's speech begins by um, saying that Yahweh has been faithful. Not one word um, of all the good promises that he has made to you and your fathers has failed. Rather, everything has come to pass. Yahweh's been faithful. Now it's your turn to be faithful. And Joshua's going to return to his favorite subject um, and also the book's central theme by by, uh, telling the people of Israel to be strong and to do or to follow the book of the law. In so doing, Joshua is passing on the same commission that he received back in chapter one. Do you see how there's this, this inclusio from the beginning of the book now to the end of the book? Be strong and follow the book of the law. And then Joshua is going to state explicitly what neglecting the book of the law looks like. If you neglect the look, the book of the law, you will do the following. Let's jump to chapter 23. Um, 
Keep the book of the law that you may not mix with these nations, that you may not make marriages with these nations that remain among you, those that they failed to drive out. Remember ch chapter 13. Um, and then in so doing, you'd make mention of their gods. You'd cling to these nations um, and forsake Yahweh. Well, if you do that, Joshua continues, know for certain that Yahweh, your God, he will no longer drive out these nations uh, that are before you. Yahweh went before you in, in, in the commander of the army of the Lord to drive out the nations. Well, that commander is going to go home and not help you anymore. Um, but rather, these nations that remain, they will be a snare and a trap for you. They will be thorns in your eyes until you perish off this good ground that the Lord has given to you. I mean, reading a, a statement like that and, and the emphasis and the weight that Joshua puts on it, it's almost as if Joshua expected this to happen, expected Israel to perish off the land. Moses did in his final farewell speech. Pessimism pervaded Moses' covenant renewal ceremony in Deuteronomy chapter 29. Just like pessimism pervades Joshua's covenant renewal ceremony in Joshua chapter 24. This covenant renewal ceremony is going to adopt um, the ancient Near Eastern uh, tr covenant treaty formula. Let me show you what this formula looks like and how Joshua 24 adapts um, and utilizes this formula that we find in a lot of other ancient Near Eastern texts. It begins with a prologue, and then we have this um, or preamble, and then we have this lengthy historical prologue in which Joshua uh, repeats everything that Yahweh has done for Israel, for their benefit, and then it lists the stipulations. These are everything that Israel must do to demonstrate their loyalty to their, their sovereign, to their king. And these stipulations are dominated by the word serve. Serve him in sincerity. Serve Yahweh, the Lord, your God. Now, remember how we um, mentioned earlier that each of these sections, each of these four main sections in Joshua highlights a key word. Um, the key word in the first section, the opening section, uh, chapters one through five is abar, cross, pass over into the land, then lacha, take the land, then um, chalach, divide the land, and finally abad, serve the Lord in the land. Now notice, this is, this is incredible, how the, the first keyword and the last keyword are so similar, different by only a single letter, a resh, then R, and a dalet, a, a D. And then these central two words, um, they only differ by the location of the chet. Is it at the end of the word uh, in 6 through 12? And now it's at the beginning of the word in 13 through 21. These these books, and Joshua in particular, is designed with such incredible intentionality. Um, it's really a wonder to behold. Well, Joshua is going to conclude his farewell address with the most well-known verse in the whole book of Joshua. Uh, Joshua 24, 14 and 15, choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, who are we going to serve? We are going to serve the Lord. We are going to abad the Lord. Um, kind of sounds like obey. Let's jump down to chapter 24 and look at the, the presence of the word abad, the word to, to serve. Uh, now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the, the gods that your fathers served beyond the river back in uh, Babylon, uh, Mesopotamia, and those gods that your fathers served in Egypt. Um, and you know what? If it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, fine. Choose this day whom you will serve. Um, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And, and after Joshua makes this, this, this call, this call to obey and to serve Yahweh, it launches this back and forth uh, between uh, the people and Joshua. And then the people respond. And then Joshua fires right back. And then the people. And then Joshua again. Well, the people, they are going to say, we will serve the Lord. He's our God. We're going to do it. We promise. But look what Joshua says, you are not able to serve the Lord. Isn't that, that, that ominous? Um, you are not able to serve the Lord? 
Well, Moses, he felt the same way about this same generation um, of Israelites. This is back in Deuteronomy 31. And immediately after this commissioning of Joshua, where he's told to be strong and courageous and I will be with you, look, look what Moses says in uh, verse 29. For I know that after my death, you will surely act corruptly. You will turn aside from the way that I've commanded you. And in days to come, evil will befall you. You will be exiled from out of the land um, after my death. Now, isn't it curious how the book of Joshua is going to end with the same unpromising, unhopeful, bleak passing of the baton to the next generation? Um, it's this passing of the, of the baton occurs after the death of Joshua, just like Moses said, that after my death, you will turn away. Um, but look how the book does have this, this positive statement as well about the present generation. We're turning now to the end of the book of Joshua, its final verses where we're told that Joshua, a son of Nun, um, the servant of the Lord, now notice he's only called the servant of the Lord after his death, not before. Joshua, the servant of the Lord, died, 110 years old. And then verse 31, Israel served the Lord, Abad, all the days of Joshua, woohoo! And all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, woohoo! But the question is, the question that hangs over the book of Joshua is that what will happen after that generation dies? Will they serve Yahweh then as well? Now, we do know that so long as Israel remains committed to uh, the book of the law of Moses, then Yahweh will fight for them and they will have success in the land as, as Yahweh's kingdom of priests on behalf of the nations. But these warning signs here at the end of the book of Joshua and scattered throughout show us that Israel's strength to keep the law of Moses is small, and it testifies to a need of a divine strength, which is offered not through Moses, but through the Messiah-mediated new covenant.